Um, well, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started and we'll probably have a few people um, rolling in um, as we go. Um, so very excited to be here with you today. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Brenna Davis and I work at the Ignatian Solidarity Network as the Director of Integral Ecology. Um, and just wanna thank you for coming to the second of our two-part training on ecological, um, centering ecological action and gratitude. Um, and so if you missed the first part, that's okay. We'll get you up to speed today. Um, but just so you know, we did send out a recording um, if you do want to catch up with that. Um, and I'm excited to be here with Sam King. So Sam. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam King, and I serve as the Ecology and Sustainability Coordinator for the Marist School Network of the United States. And I also work with the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. So really passionate about working with schools to live out this spirit of ecological conversion. And I've been really blessed to uh, cross paths with Brenna in the context of a gratitude-based learning program, which we did together through Anora, um, which we'll talk about momentarily. And we're really excited to share this um, framework of gratitude-based learning with you all and dialogue about how we can use this expansive lens to make a positive difference in our home communities. Hi. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll get started by just saying a little bit about Honora Global. Um, so this was uh, started by a Brophy Prep alum um, who is just really um, passionate about um, caring for creation and kind of he had this realization that um, he was doing a lot of his climate work from a fear-based place um, instead of a place of love. Um, and so he um, has started this sort of innovation lab um, to invite students and teachers um, and different organizations to try to center their work in gratitude. Um, and so so though Sam and I do this work in the context of schools, I know that some folks on this call aren't in a school context, so um, please know to any context that, that we're working in. Yeah, and our guiding ethos today and with gratitude-based learning is this idea of what if we led with love instead of fear, right? For those of you who work on ecological issues, it's easy to fall into uh, a place of fear when thinking about climate change and species loss and pollution issues and all the environmental justice issues that our world is facing. And it can be tempting to fall into a problem and solution kind of mindset. Um, and what gratitude-based learning is really inviting us into is to think about how do we focus on the blessings, the goodness we experience within our ecosystems, and how do we deepen into that goodness and expand on the connections that are already there. So it's sort of shifting from a problem-solving lens to an expansive uh, love-centered lens of deepening connectedness. And in um, so Sam and I enter into this work um, from the Christian Catholic tradition. Um, and so, you know, at the heart of um, uh, our faith tradition is this concept of Eucharist of Thanksgiving. Um, and so, um, and, you know, in the Ignatian world, um, St. Ignatius talks about the root of all sin being ingratitude. And so I, I think that sometimes we, um, gratitude can kind of sound like this fluffy concept or, you know, we're making gratitude lists, but um, we hope that through this experience, um, we can really show practical ways to apply gratitude that will, like Sam said, make our work more expansive. Absolutely. And I've really resonated with this quote from Thomas Aquinas that the root of religious experience is gratitude, this supreme expression of gratitude for the miracle of existence and for the bounteous abundance of the earth. At the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge that gratitude is really embedded in indigenous life ways around the world. And we see this very much, uh, for those of you familiar with Robin Wall Kimmer and her influential book, Braiding Sweetgrass, 
Um, this quote actually comes from another essay called The Service Berry, where she writes that gratitude is so much more than a polite thank you. It is the thread that connects us in a deep relationship, simultaneously physical and spiritual, as our bodies are fed and spirits nourished by the sense of belonging, which is the most vital of foods. Gratitude creates a sense of abundance, the knowing that you have what you need. In that climate of sufficiency, our hunger for more abates, and we take only what we need in respect for the generosity of the giver. So obviously, Kimmer has been a profound exponent of this, you know, uh, this virtue of gratitude from the Potawatomi tradition. Um, and we also see gratitude across many different cultural and religious traditions around the world. So the meditation we'll, we're about to um, invite folks into comes, for instance, from the Zen Buddhist tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. Yeah. And so um, just as we center ourselves today, um, we're going to begin in kind of a moment of reflection, of contemplation, of prayer, of meditation. Um, and so that, like Sam said, this comes from Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and I think that this, um, I really appreciate the gift that um, Buddhism has given in just the kind of very practical way um, that the tradition um, talks about um, yeah, our, our experience of being in the world, sometimes the illogical language, at least the theology that I've studied in the Catholic tradition can be really heady. Um, so I'm just going to invite you, if you would like to close your eyes, um, just to get grounded, to settle yourselves, even though we're in um, a virtual space, um, we are embodied humans um, having an experience, and we are grateful that you are pausing in the middle of your day to join us. breath. If you are a poet, you will see clearly that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without a cloud, there will be no rain. Without rain, trees cannot grow. And without trees, we cannot make paper. The cloud is essential for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not here, the sheet of paper cannot be here either. So we can say that the cloud and the paper enter are. We look into the sheet of paper even more deeply. We can see the sunshine in it. The sunshine is not there. The forest cannot grow. In fact, nothing can grow. Even we cannot grow without sunshine. And so we know the sunshine is also in the sheet of paper. The paper and sunshine enter are. And if we continue to look, we can see the logger who cut the tree and brought it to the mill to be transformed into paper. And we see the wheat. We know the logger cannot exist without their daily bread. And therefore, the wheat that became their bread is also in the sheet of paper. And the logger's father and mother are in it too. When we look in this way, we see that without all of these things, the sheet of paper cannot exist. So now I invite you to just, you know, as we're contemplating this, um, these ripple effects, these beautiful ripple effects um, that we uh, are the recipients of in gratitude, I invite you to contemplate maybe a piece of clothing that you're wearing, or maybe something that you've recently eaten or drank. I invite you to just think about the complex web of life of human and non-human species um, that have made this thing possible. So if it's a shirt, maybe it's made out of cotton, weather systems, the earthworms in the soil, the hydrological system, and then all of the hands, right, that, that touch this item along its way to you. I invite you just to let your mind wander and ponder in gratitude for the complexity of the system and in the acknowledgement that we can't even clothe ourselves without, um, without this interconnected system of nature.
so we pray in gratitude um, for this integral ecology, um, this web of life that supports us, and for all of the faith traditions and indigenous wisdom or those models um, that remind us of um, the importance of centering everything that we do in gratitude. Amen. Thank you, Brenna, for that beautiful meditation. So our goals and hopes for today's session are to leave us feeling connected and energized to connect with others in our home communities and in our bioregions. We're going to introduce an idea called the Chia method and how we might apply that in your particular communities. And then we're going to participate in a curiosity conversation to model how we might use curiosity and gratitude to build connections and really uh, create a culture of solidarity to live out uh, uh, the ecological um, actions that we hope to bring to our communities. And so um, in this spirit, we're going to start the way that we uh, began last time, which is, um, you know, connection is really central um, to all of this work, um, connecting with others in our communities and with ourselves. And so I'm going to invite you um, just to go into a brief conversation with one or two other people um, on the call and to talk about what you're celebrating right now in your own life. So you can just do a brief introduction of where you are in the world, who you are, and then put something that you feel comfortable sharing um, that you're celebrating. Um, if for some reason you go into a breakout room and the other person is not responsive, um, I know that there are some people who are just listening in and we are hoping this will be a really interactive session. Just come back to the main room and we'll reassign you and get you um, with some other conversation partners. Okay, so I am going to open the rooms and we'll be here for about five minutes. Okay. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I think everyone should be here now. Um, so we hope that you had uh, nice conversations. We know that they're brief, um, but we really wanted to do this because um, we're we really want to model just like this practice of like starting with celebration, um, especially I think in, in a lot of work, but especially in environmental work, I feel like sometimes we can, um, yeah, just go into like, what would we like to see different or to do better? And so um, just this invitation to always start um, by celebrating and by connecting with other people, um, I think is an important reminder. Absolutely. And we thought we would introduce uh, what's called the Chia framework um, in this spirit of gratitude-based learning. And as some of you might know, a Chia pet is uh, something that expands in water, right? Like a beautiful Chia seed. And I just had a great Chia seed salad for lunch. And um, it's we're inviting us to think about using an expansive lens of thinking about leading with love rather than fear. And so Chia stands for celebrate, hear, imagine, and action. So we just modeled the celebration phase of uh, connecting with community and celebrating the, the blessings, the goodness that we experience in our lives. So really focusing on those positive ripples, right? The, the food we enjoy, the water uh, we drink, the, the sunlight we enjoy, right? All these blessings um, that uh, the earth provides. And uh, once we experience that sense of celebration, of focusing on the good that we experience, we can move into what's called hearing phase or listening to different ideas about how we might deepen that experience of connectedness to our bioregions, to our ecosystems, and uh, doing that through a process of curiosity. So getting really curious about, for instance, if I'm interested in food systems at my school, um, who are all the uh, 
the people and living beings who help bring food to our school, right? So that would include the farmers, the farm workers who grow the food. It would include the uh, living beings, the pollinators around food production, right? The particular, particular organic or chemical inputs to grow that food. Who transports the food to our school? Who prepares the food, right? Um, who are the folks consuming the food? How do they feel about their experience, right? And so through that process of curiosity, we um, can get a, a better sense of how we are embedded in our particular uh, ecosystems, right? And we can start thinking about particular interventions based on the, the, um, the things we're getting curious about, right? And the uh, collaborative sort of information gathering process we're going through. Um, once we do that, we can enter into an imagine phase of imagining a particular intervention in our uh, school context that might expand on the blessings or the goodness that already exists. How do we get more connected to our food, more connected to the folks and the beings who grow our food, right? And that can be a process of, um, of speaking with folks in our community and also doing some external uh, research. And then action, finally coming up with some kind of action uh, plan based on this uh, experience. Now, Chia is a framework that we can repeat at all levels of a gratitude-based learning experience. So in this webinar, for instance, we're trying to um, emulate the spirit of Chia, right? And in our meetings with people, we can model uh, this method to uh, deepen our uh, gratitude, curiosity, and ultimately um, collaborative action. Uh, and so the um, Chia framework, again, this is something that, um, this is a framework that Onora uses with their students who are in their innovation lab. So we're gonna, like, we're giving you this framework and um, we're we're hoping that you can try it out and see if it feels like a good fit, but um, like, please don't let the acronyms get in the way of, you know, what, what we're trying to do here, which is just basically um, start from a place of gratitude. So in our last um, session, we basically did some ecosystem mapping. And so everybody picked kind of a system at their institution that they were really curious about exploring, right? So some some people were looking at waste, some people maybe were looking at, you know, uh, energy. And so what we're going to invite you to do um, is to go into a one-to-one -one breakout conversation um, and practice this kind of Chia conversation model or framework. Um, and so Sam and I are going to model it before we send you off. But really what this is an opportunity to do um, is to just kind of... Uh, express out loud kind of hopes and what you're celebrating and also like what the possibilities are. So generally a Chia conversation, like, the, and we'll talk about this later, it would probably happen with like a group at your school and you would, um, it, it would be a little bit more expansive, but we did just want to practice it one-on-one -on -one because it is um, completely possible to do. Um, so Sam and I are just going to like model a truncated version of a Chia conversation now. Um, and then we'll also give you questions to kind of um, help you through the process, but really it is just really about um, the steps as Sam described them. Great. Yeah, Brenna, I know you're serving as director of integral ecology for the Ignatian Solidarity Network and, and doing all these amazing ecological initiatives. What are you celebrating in your vocation uh, these days. Yeah, the thing that I am most excited about was the summer we had a summit for high school educators that are working on ecological issues um, in their schools. Um, Sid was there, uh, which was really awesome. So we had 22 educators from 16 different schools. Um, and I'm just really excited about the network that we're building um, and just the potential for all of us to work together. Awesome. Yeah, it's really exciting to hear that you convened this summit, brought all these amazing people together. What are you curious about in your network? Like, um, who are you hoping to connect with? And what questions do you have to deepen this work and the momentum coming from that summit? 
Yeah. So I think I'm really curious about um, what our ongoing networking will look like. Um, everyone was really excited to start a community of practice in the middle of the summer. Um, but as the school year starts to um, it comes upon us, things get really busy. And so I'm just really curious to hear from folks in our network about like what will be most exciting to keep us engaged. And, you know, so I might need to have some one-to-one -one conversations with individual educators in our group. Um, and also, yeah, just curious about like um, what we can do to like make the meetings exciting so that people will actually show up um, when things get busy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you have any ideas for particular uh, interventions or ways you can uh, kind of sustain that momentum through the school year? Are there any ideas that are emerging from your conversations with other folks? Yeah, so I think that um, something that has started to emerge through a few conversations is like collective action and how could all of our schools who are in like varying parts of the country um, take action together from their different locations. So I'm starting to really imagine what would it look like for all of us to work together either to advocate on a similar issue at our schools or maybe for all of us to do some sort of waste audit at the same time in the school year and then celebrate that together um, and bring kind of that data back to the administration and say, we're doing this as a group of 16 schools um, just to hopefully get a little bit more weight behind it. So I'm kind of imagining what collective action could look like that won't um, overly tax our already hardworking educators. Right. That that all sounds really exciting, Ben. And, and what um, actions would, would you need to take to create that uh, collective action among your community? Yeah, I think that one of the things is I'm just doing a good job at the beginning of getting a lot of buy-in and getting people excited um, to come to our meetings. So the first thing I need to do is this week is figure out what time we are meeting when our first meeting is um, and to get some dates on the calendar um, just so that people can start to commit. Um, and then I think I am hoping to have some one-to-one conversations with um, some of the educators from the group um, to see um, if anyone is willing to kind of help take the lead at the beginning um, as, as we get started so that we can do this communally and we do something that collectively everyone wants to do. Well, sounds very exciting. Thank you so much for sharing, Brenna, and for modeling that Chia conversation. Yeah, thanks, Sam, for listening and for asking uh, such great questions. <laughs> um, so now we wanted to model that because we understand that like a a new framework is just kind of funny um, and you are all adults and you know how to have conversations, but I do think that this kind of flow um, is really nice. And what's really cool is in the six week course that um, Sam and I did together with Adam at Anora um, was that like, that was kind of the frame of all of our meetings as we were kind of trying to discern what's our next step, where are we going? Um, was really like, we started the meeting with what are we celebrating? what do we need to learn or what do we need to understand, you know? And so we just went through this process. And so um, I hope that it can be helpful to you. So what, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna, again, send people um, into breakout groups for about 10 minutes. It'll be a one-to-one -one conversation this time um, to give everybody an opportunity to kind of explore something that they're excited about. Um, so if you are, unable or uninterested in having a one-to-one -one conversation, you can either send Sam or I a private message and we can take you out of a group. Um, or if you get to your breakout room and for whatever reason, the other person that you're speaking to isn't responding, just come back to the main room and we'll get you um, partnered up. Um, and so these are some sample questions that you could ask kind of as the conversation is flowing. But again, these are just suggestions um, and, you know, you um, can kind of take the conversation um, in whatever direction makes the most sense to you. Um, I am going to try to pa paste the, con or the questions into the chats really quickly. Um, just so that you have them and you might need to copy and paste them. I'm sorry, I should have made like a little guide if you want them because they may disappear um, when we go into our breakout room. So here they are in the chat. All right. Um, and so we'll send you to your breakout rooms now. 
Great. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a fruitful conversation. And that's one of our hopes for this webinar is to uh, allow you to make connections with other folks and to just enter into this process of gratitude-based learning. And so we're curious to hear from you all, like how was your experience going through that uh, Chia method? Uh, do you have any questions and yeah, or reflections from that conversation? Well, um, I, I know for me, it's my first time on, I didn't get to see the other one. And as I said, I celebrated today because not many Wednesdays. When treatment is over, I'm back on Wednesdays. But one of the things that the process is, uh, you know, I was trying to, I'm running them off. I almost lost connection for a minute. But long story short, I thought as I connected with uh, Amanda, it was, a, th there was a connection, even though it's technology and a vibrancy. And I think I felt like a little gentle reflection from each of us to the other uh, of, um, it's just the little things that that when you start sharing, all of a sudden you realize there's connections. And as we plan our time, whether it's her ministry or mine, um, we, we got a lot going for us. And can I trust, can I trust myself to believe that these are God's graces and then, you know, engage? And that I think this process is an excellent way to engage some people. And I works with some tough people at times. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I found it the same way. It, it seems uh, it's a simple way. Uh, I was very uh, um, encouraged by the other person sharing. Sometimes I get overwhelmed by everything that's going on, and her, her, I. It was uplifting for me, and it clarified things for me. And I, I, I find it, you know, uh, as well, it would be a, it is a, a great method. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. I would like to add something rather similar to Mary and Marge, but um, I think it's a great way to see that there is so much more that connects us than divides us. And I really appreciated that out of it. Thank you, Amanda. I went into a conversation with Tiffany um, and I put the ball in her court um, because mm -hmm. I, I work on a uh, the Laudato C Action uh, Platform Committee for my congregation, but there wasn't any particular uh, project that I, I had that I was interested in celebrating. But in the course of the conversation, uh, uh, Tiffany was telling me about the composting that uh, they do at her university mm -hmm. on the other side of the country. And it, then it got me excited and remembering that I, I'm trying to start some composting where I live. So thanks, Tiffany, and thanks for the process. Thank you. I'm so, so glad you had a, a, a good dialogue with Tiffany, Jean. Thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, I share your passion for compost and yeah, uh, putting, turning food scraps into wondrous new nutrients for the soil. So um, yeah, really exciting process. Yeah. Any other reflections? I, I, I would just like to say that, is it Father Garrick? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, inspired me so much um, because he's he's got a plan and it involves Sam and, and he he rightfully realized that Sam could uh, bring great depth to the subjects that we're talking about and and share them with others and at his monastery uh, is perhaps having groups come in to hear speakers such as Sam, but starting with Sam, I think it is. And um, it was very well thought out, including the idea that you'd first bring in people who were halfway there, who are, who are already interested and engaged in these subjects. And then they will talk to other people and then they will get engaged. But you don't start with the people who are really 
far afield or you know maybe maybe curious but not really uh not really as well versed as some others maybe not well versed i don't mean that but is engaged um but i think um it would be helpful for the group if you would share your ideas um that i heard father garrick could you share those with everybody well i don't know whether it's appropriate or not but uh, one please, of my please. one of my reflections on our experience is that I did most of the talking and um, and tried to follow those points. And I guess my question is, um, where does the role of dialogue come in in a process like that? You know, do I invite the other person maybe to help imagine some things for me? Or mm -hmm. what do you think of that, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, or is it is it primarily geared to a person just kind of teasing somebody listening to the person tease these ideas out any reflections on that yes um as i said when i started the process i i was the interviewer and that's how i wanted to be but as i listened to her as i listened to tiffany describe what was happening it surfaced questions and ideas in me that then I changed my position and we started a, a conversation, we started a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying in some cases, the process itself with the sharing of ideas will bring about a dialogue. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I found in our conversation. Yeah, and I, I think that the, and Sam, you can jump in. I think that the intent, right, when we do these conversations, we were just, we wanted people to be able to practice, but the intent is that this would be done with like a group of people. So when Sam and I went through this process, there were four of us. And so it was like, uh, it was a dialogue and a conversation, right? And if you're working, you know, say it's your green team at school, right? Like you might start out by saying like, what do we want to celebrate, you know, from this past year, right? And like, and then, and so like many voices are um, definitely encouraged and invited to be in the dialogue. So it can be a two person kind of mm -hmm. process and framework, but I think it does work best when multiple voices are involved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to model two different modes of exchange that this was the chia method which again we can do with a larger group and you know this metaphor of the hive mind like a, a beehive right from that beehive uh emerges amazing ideas when we get together we celebrate and we you know we learn from somebody who has put in a three bin compost system right and we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel right so um, there's that uh, sort of chia method conversation. And we're also in uh, a little bit going to model curiosity conversations, which, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm having one with Brenna, I'm doing more listening and really primarily hearing her story and learning more about her. So mm -hmm. yeah, we're trying to model a few different kinds of um, engagement in this process. Good. That's helpful. And it does feel a kind of like communal discernment, actually, like as we're talking about this right now, right? It's like, I think Chia, like Adam doesn't do this work from like a religious, like or faith-based context, but like, I think like, yeah, it's kind of a communal discernment process. Sorry, who did I cut off? No, it was just the, um, Dolores, Dolores, I think. To go, go ahead, Sister Dolores, go ahead. I think it was maybe Julia than Mary. Who was? Yeah. Did Sister Del Dolores need to say anything? Because oh. I did have a, a okay. quick. Not particularly, but um, as, as long as as long as I am talking about it, one of the things um, that I I would like to start bringing up with people. Uh, I had talked to uh, one of our. Um, uh, funeral directors and a uh, green a green burial and I know that's a hard thing to bring up with people but I think it's an important one mm -hmm. thank you for sharing yeah. Yeah. all I was going to say was um in our group there were three of us 
Um, so we made the best we could with the time with three, which was wonderful because Joe was there and Sydney and um, and Sydney really asked a few questions of us that got us moving in some, but Sydney, you didn't get a chance to speak. So I don't want to put you on the, the, the spot here, but um, were there pieces of this that you, you would have added to if, if, you know, if we had had a little more time just in that direction of talking that we were about our own projects, you didn't really get a chance to express that. Oh, you're on mute. Still on mute. There yeah. I am. That's me. Um, thank you for that, Julia. I um, no, I've I really love the listening part of it, and I um, I liked the I I liked that we were that there were three of us. Um, and what I I I guess what I'm when I'm imagining and then thinking about action, I think that doing the chia process is imagining and and action like just doing the process and having the conversation. And it's making me excited for thinking about like some of the tough, um, some of the invitations <laughs> to do some of the challenging work at our school uh, will best happen through these kinds of conversations. I'm just trying to think about like what Sam was saying earlier about food, food systems and, and involving the many constituents and thinking how cool it would be to like find who's off during a shared planning period um, and take a, like a Chia Amea walk, Amea's walk together and just learn about how other people operate in these, in these systems. So that's, the, that's, what, that's what's really spinning in my head right now is how can I bring this model to, um, to encountering other people in my community with whom I, I don't usually have contact. Thanks, Sid. And Sister Mary, did you have a final comment? Well, now, Brenda, do I ever have a final comment? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you know, one of the things that, as we shared in our group, the two of us, you know, like I said, it was my first time here. I, I, as I backed away from it, I found that we can't allow ourselves to get locked into the the the, the, the method, the process. You know, you have to have a comfort level. And I think for me, if I were to back away today, once I'd said what I was excited about, like, let's say I'm, I'm all gone ho with the season of creation stuff going on, and I'm working with Franciscans and their charism of healing. So, you know, we, you look at that, and once you shared that, it was amazing. The other person was able to, you know, I say, well, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go with it because I'm working with former nurses, but they're healing. And then I think about, well, what, what, what needs to be healed in creation, whether it's us or, or the environmental. And it, it was amazing. The process kind of took care of itself then, mm -hmm. because sometimes when we start something, I know for me, I won't say we, I get a little stilt to trying to follow. I mean, you try to follow the lockstep, you may as well forget it. So I think it's that fluidity. And I think when somebody mentioned, how do you get that dialogue? I think we're more joyful and exuberant about something. It's almost like that synodal process. There will be a communion and there will be a, a participation because basically we all have that mission. Amen. Final, Brenna. <laughs> Thanks, Sister Mary. And I think like, I, we're just going to keep reiterating this, the whole um, kind of invitation that we're inviting everyone to, because it could, we don't want people to get bogged down in acronyms is like, am I leading with love? Am I leading with trying to connect like that? If you're going back to that and you can answer yes, then, then we're in a good spot. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share the slides again. And Brenna. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to move into kind of another experiential piece. And so Sam and I were just talking about this and we're going to, we'll send up some follow-up resources um, with all of this information. But if Chia is kind of this process that we are using internally um, in our groups to kind of help ideate and have this process of communal discernment of like, where do we want to focus and what do we want to learn and what are we grateful for? Um, curiosity conversations are kind of our opportunity then to go out 
out into the world and to get really curious about other people who are in these ecosystems that we um, inhabit. And so um, really um, what you're invited to do in a curiosity conversation, and I think in organizing circles, there's sometimes called one-to-ones, right, um, is really just consider who do I want or need to connect with, right? So if I'm like really interested at about waste systems in um, my school, like who would be a good person to connect with um, just to learn more about this process? Um, and the real goal of this process is to kind of see and name the positive ripple effects. So like, you know, I always keep going back to the Brophy Press example, the students went and like expressed this authentic gratitude um, to their cafeteria staff um, for everything that they do to feed them so that the students can learn so that they can, you know, go out into the world and, you know, change the world, right? Like they, when they started to think about the ripple effects, um, they, they really saw the great impact that all of these um, interconnections in this ecosystem had on their own lives. Um, and so a real goal is to like state, uh, a thank you to the person, right? Like a really authentic thank you um, for um, what they do and, and really to make people feel seen and heard. Um, each person is sacred and precious as we know, but we also know that we are real life people. And I just know that when I worked at um, the Chris Array High School here in Cleveland, um, the facilities director, he was wonderful, but he would see me coming and sometimes he would run away. Um, right? Because he was just like, oh no, Brenna's going to ask me for something. Um, and so um, how do we make people feel seen and reminded that they are an unrepeatable once-ness um, and really ask them about their experience? I think I did a lot of telling to Dan in our school about what we should do and about what I wanted to see. Um, and it, it, I wish I had had this approach when I was working in a school to really ask him um, what his experience was like and ha to have the humility to say like, I don't know everything um, and that I could really amplify my perspective by um, by listening to other people. So curiosity conversation just does that. Um, it's getting really curious about the other person and about the system. Um, and, you know, ahead of time, you might want to set intentions about your curiosity conversation and kind of what you hope to learn. But again, like Sister Mary said, um, we also want to be flexible in the conversation and the Holy Spirit might go in a different direction than that we're expecting. Um, but it's just a really a moment to learn about another person and to not um it's not about again enforcing our will or like having an, an ulterior motive and saying well I'm gonna go talk to Dan because I really know that I want this new recycle bin right it's not about um trying to kind of like be manipulative but really just about like kind of like Sid said, let's go have an Emmaus walk with somebody um, who maybe I don't always connect with in a deeper way um, in my ecosystem on my campus. Um, and so again, this isn't like a revolutionary concept, but we are going to invite um, all of us here today to kind of practice this um, because it's really, I think it's really easy to be curious about people that we don't know. Um, but the people that we see on the day to day, sometimes we forget about their unrepeatable onceness um, and that they have this like really unique story and perspective. Um, so we're going to go into a curiosity conversation for 10 minutes um, and we're going to invite you to uh, to kind of again, go through this process of the first partner, we're gonna invite you to answer this question. Um, so this is like also kind of personal and helping us to define our ecological story and how we're connected to um, to this issue. So why, what do you, why do you care about ecological issues? Sorry, that's a typo. Um, and what do you hope to bring to your community around these issues? So like the first partner is just gonna answer that question. And then the second partner is just gonna get really curious and ask follow-up questions and just kind of try to deepen and learn more about um, about this person's story that that you're meeting here for the, for the first time um, potentially. And then at the end of like five minutes, you can express gratitudes or, or what you appreciated um, and then we'll switch. So again, this does feel a little forced because we're practicing, um, but we think that it's just like nice to have the chance to practice. So it's really, this has less um, sentence stems and questions, Sister Mary. It's really just getting curious um, after the person starts to tell you their story. Um, does anyone have any questions or Sam, do you have any thoughts to add to any of that? I think that, I think that was great. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. So we're gonna um, reorganize uh, our um, rooms. And just give me one second, a couple of people left. So I'm just trying to make sure everybody has a conversation partner. All right, so we're gonna, again, break out for 10 minutes. So the, the first five minutes, the first person will kind of explore this question of like, what ties you to this issue? Why are you showing up on a Zoom in the middle of the summer to talk about ecological action? Um, and what are your hopes for your community? And the other person's just gonna ask um, evocative follow-up questions. All right, we'll open the rooms now and I'll send a reminder when five minutes is over and then we'll switch. Okay. Well, welcome back everyone. Um, thanks so much for engaging in those conversations. Um, and we just wanted to take a couple of minutes now just to see if anybody had thoughts about curiosity conversations and right. or questions, just any anything about how that was for you. It's helpful to me to hear from people who are doing this work in other um, in other organizational models, um, and also just to be outside of my own school community and having this conversation because um, it feels like there's a lot there's just a lot of known quantities or what and maybe that's um, that is I it's not a maybe that is limiting because I feel like I know um, or know what to expect from other people in my, in my own um, community. So it breaks, breaks that open a little bit um, to hear from people who are, who are working in, in, other, in, in other works um, in a way that inspires me to maybe see things through new eyes when I return to my own school. Definitely, and I think, yeah, it's something we're trying to emulate here is um, is thinking globally, thinking collectively, and acting locally, right? So getting curious, you know, expanding our uh, sense of beloved community. Um, uh, Diarmid Omerchu, who Father Garrick introduced me to, calls this the companionship of empowerment, I think is a beautiful uh, idea for thinking about the kind of ecological communities we're trying to nurture. And these curiosity conversations are a great way of doing that. Um, yeah, any other thoughts or reflections on the curiosity conversation? Well, what, one of the things that, you know, that, that, that we talked about and I shared was that, um, you know, you, you talk about ecological issues, we're talking about ourselves too. You know, I think that the more I, for me, why I care about ecology is because I care about human beings. I care, I care about humanity. And as Francis says, there's no two issues. There's one complex issue, you know, uh, creation and the data C talks about environmental and social issues. And, and in talking about that, the, then we, we really do become a beloved community because then as we, the more we delve into that and share what we're dealing with, then it could spill over into a, the immigrant at the border or the Russian-Ukraine war. Uh, it could uh, into trafficking. They're all connected. And so as oh, Chief Seattle said a long time ago, you Americans know better than me, the spit on the earth is to spit on ourselves. So the realization of this curiosity uh, conversation is that there's no separateness. We, we become the beloved community and we keep connecting and connecting in the ripple effect and only the Lord, that's infinite. So that, that was something that came out of ours. Mm. Beautifully said. Mary, right, thank you so much. Maybe we have time for one more reflection or thought if anybody wants to share. even about how it felt to connect with your story of why. You know, this process, this second part, this curiosity part, it was not as clear to me as the first, as the, uh, uh, I, the Chia, Chia. <laughs> Chia, yeah, part. 
I don't know if uh, maybe a demonstration and maybe you did. And I, I just had a hard time uh, zeroing in as to what I was supposed to do or how I was supposed. Uh, Jean helped me to uh, clarify a bit, but uh, uh, it was it was harder for me. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, our hope was to um, model Chia as a way of sort of acting collectively within an ecology organization or, you know, uh, a kind of a team of folks who are thinking collectively about how they want to um, make a positive difference in their community. And the curiosity conversation we kind of framed as a more open-ended way of uh, connecting with more folks outside of the, uh, the particular um, uh, kind of circles that we might find ourselves in, but who are, of course, in our wider circle, right? So just like bringing in more voices, more perspectives. And so, yeah, the curiosity conversation you could see is like a more open-ended way of, that's not about necessarily uh, even getting toward the action stage, but just purely building connection and relationship. Yeah. And again, you know, an example from Brophy um, was the, um, they went and talked to people at Arizona State University about their composting system. And they just got really curious about like how that got started, right? Like why they were doing that, why they had chosen what they did. So, you know, I think like, again, once we have like a, also like a more specific context, I think the conversations start to, to make more you know, get a little more pointed, but the, the general idea is like, how do we get curious about the people that, you know, are around us when sometimes, yeah, you, you feel like they're a known entity. So. Great. Thanks. I think for the sake of time, we're, uh, we'll go back to um, a few more um, slides and Brenna, do you want to um, tell yeah. us about this? Yeah. So just very briefly again, because we understand we don't want to give you um, like acronym fatigue. But again, in the kind of um, Anora's gratitude-based model, um, basically they go through cycles, right? And so to me, the cycle reminds me a lot of the pastoral circle, right? But we have kind of this discovery phase and we're going to go more in depth into this, um, an imagination phase, a collective imagination phase, a phase where we figure out like what we're zeroing in on, what we want to improve and then implementing. And so this is kind of like a cycle that you could use at your school, at your church, in your religious community um, to really like focus in on one thing at a time. Um, and what's beautiful about it is it is a spiral. So it continues, right? So like once we kind of go through this process, we evaluate and maybe we have a new discovery or a new focus, but it's always centered in a culture of encounter, of curiosity and, and of relationship. Um, so Sam is going to get a little more practical. Definitely. Uh, thanks, Brenna. And so in bringing Chia, which is sort of, as you mentioned, it's a framework we can bring to every stage of this process. So in a given meeting, in a given conversation, we can kind of be returning to Chia as not so much a formula, but a general ethos that we can cultivate. And so in the first stage, we're discovering what's there in our ecosystem now and what might be needed, right? Um, you know, this is, you know, the process of connection and curiosity, right? Stage two is really stepping into imagine, discovering what's possible. Brenna mentioned Brophy doing um, community-wide research, looking at peer schools, institutions, seeing what is possible um, in terms of food systems or waste audits or um, electrification, renewable energy, um, whatever you're focused on. And then we move into improve. So trying to focus on one idea or direction and again, expanding on the good that's already there. So thinking about expanding positive ripple effects. And then we can move into the implement phase, which is making it happen, right? In a collaborative way. And then we can uh, continue this cycle as Brenna was saying, in a way that's adaptable to our particular environments and our time realities. So we came up with this graphic as an example of how you might 
implement this process in a given semester, for instance, or a, a season. So at the end of August, you might be in the discovery phase. You're forming an ecology club. In the Marist community, we have a green team with over 50 student leaders from our 10 schools, over 20 faculty representatives. Um, as we move into September, we might embark on curiosity conversations. We get really curious about, uh, and, and we, we realize folks are really interested in looking at food. So we might speak to everybody in, uh, uh, invested in food in our given communities, right? And we enter into this research phase. In October, we might step into the imagine phase where we're doing even more research, for instance, at other schools or institutions. And we're thinking about what uh, other potential models we could bring into our community. November might be the improve stage where we create a plan for a three bin compost system. And we collectively come together, we are working with um, student leaders, faculty representatives, cafeteria workers, um, administrators, to create a plan. And then December, uh, we could be in an implementation phase. And again, this can be adapted to over the course of a year or um, in a, uh, a sh shorter fall season, for instance, depending on your particular context. Yeah. And then um, Chia is just the method throughout. So always starting with celebrating. So when we're in the discovery phase, what do we want to celebrate? You know, and so you just use that again and again and again. Um, so we're, we know that we're short on time. So I'm going to put this into the chat, um, but I made a, um, a version of this document that anyone can edit when you download it. Um, and so, you know, we understand that not everybody's at a school and things don't always work on semesters. Um, and that even being in a school, um, you know, time can feel short, but we did just want to give you kind of this template that you could use um, as to kind of like map out the upcoming semester um, and understanding it may not work out like this, but like really like discovery, what group are you going to be working with specifically this year? Um, and in September, like, what do you want to learn? So after you chia with your group and kind of see like, what are we celebrating? What are we interested in? What ideas do we have? What actions potentially could we imagine taking, right? Then you can start to kind of like go into a discovery phase um, and, and keep moving forward. Um, Oh, thank you, Amanda. I'll change the access to the Google Doc right now. Um, but basically, that is kind of the the process of of uh, making your own semester plan. Is just like how do we keep moving forward, but always starting um, in gratitude. Um, so. Um, we invite you to use that if it's helpful. Again, uh, we want to reiterate, and if you reload the document, you should be able to access it now if you refresh it. But we just want to reiterate, this is all about leading with love. It's all about leading with curiosity. It's all about leading from a place of gratitude um, versus like, again, when we're really entrenched in these systems, it can sometimes be like, we can come in with this like oppositional energy um, and we're really just tapping into like the Trinity and the culture of encounter and this like relationship um, that's at the heart of a lot of our schools, if they are Christian, if they are Catholic and trying to like figure out how do we like very practically live this out um, as we enter into this work. So with that. Um, yeah, thank you. If you have any questions or uh, Sam and I can hang on for a minute, but we do understand it's the end of our time together. Um, and so, yeah, I don't want to speak for Sam, but I am like very grateful. Uh, we're very grateful that you um, spent this time with us um, and we will send some follow-up information and email. We'll send our email addresses, um, resources to connect Honora if you want to learn more. Um, so, yeah. Thank absolutely. you. Yep, our contact information is here as well if anyone wants to get in touch. But thank you so much for being here, everybody. Thank you, Brenna, my amazing partner in this process. And yeah, look forward to staying connected. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>